Today we're very lucky to be joined um, by the Chief Whip of the DA in South Africa. And f do you want to start off with the first question, Jasper? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got a first question up. Um, with youth unemployment sitting at 63% in 2014 and the current skill shortages we are experiencing as a country, how do you, as a South Africa, uh, how do you think South Africa should address this problem? Mm. Well, I think one of the big problems that we, we have is that uh, we have school leavers that are not being uh, absorbed into the labour market, particularly mm. because our labour system in South Africa disincentivizes people to take uh, unskilled workers into the workforce. So what we have proposed as a party is something called a youth wage subsidy, mm -hmm. which provides a tax incentive for business owners to take school leavers into their business. Uh, they then get a subsidy for it, and they then uh, impart the skills and knowledge to them. Uh, and then obviously at the end of that, those school leavers leave with a skill that they've picked up there or absorbed into that particular company. But the truth of the matter is we're not uh, going to be able to absorb huge amounts of school leavers and students into the workforce with an economy that's growing uh, at zero percent as the current forecast by the Reserve Bank is. So we have to have a major re-stimulation of the South African economy. And that's going to mean changes to our labor regime. It's going to mean that we need to have far more co policy coherence from government. The moment we have a, a, a cabinet that is completely divided on the future direction of the South African economy. So they talk about the National Development Plan on the one side, which is very uh, based in a market-based uh, approach. We've got the New Growth Path, which is far more state-led, and the Industrial Policy Action Plan. And none of those documents speak to each other in any way, shape, or form. In fact, many of the principles are diametrically opposed to each other. So until we get that, that policy coherence, we're not going to be able to attract international investors. We're not going to give incentives to local investors to be able to grow the economy and start being able to absorb the 8.9 million South Africans who do not have the dignity of work in South Africa, the bulk of those being uh, young uh, students. So foreign direct investment was down 74% last year, if I'm not incorrect, mm. to about $1.5 billion. So mm. why do you think the South African economy stagnated in that way, and why do you think it's disincentivized foreign investment? Mm. Well, I think that there's, as I said, it's a policy confusion uh, that's uh, a major uh, push factor against international investors. You know, we go to international forums and say that we are open for business, uh, for international firms to come and invest in South Africa, yet we pass laws like the expropriation bill that are a major disincentive for foreign investors to come here. Why would you bring a factory here, create jobs and a market, only to have a state entity in 10 years' time say, well, it's in the national interest for us to expropriate that and, and take over that industry. No investor is going to come here and invest unless the investment is protected. Now, you marry bizarre legislation like the expropriation bill with things like the promotion and protection of investment bill, which does precisely the opposite, which actually dilutes foreign uh, investors' rights in terms of the South African legal context uh, and the, the bizarre policy confusion from government. Uh, and it's a toxic mix of rep repelling legislation and environment for international investors. So they're looking not only at South Africa, they look at emerging economies as a basket. And they are, are uh, establishing themselves in emerging economies that are welcoming towards them. Uh, also, we make it very difficult with our new stringent visa regulations for foreign companies to be able to bring workers here and, in fact, for their directors to even come into the country. Uh, and so we keep saying we're open for business, but we keep putting up barriers, making it virtually impossible for people to come and invest here. On that note, do you think something like, I think other countries like Portugal have mm -hmm. something called the Golden Visa, where if you buy property from the country, you almost get a visa, a residence visa, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. With the current 90-day period, period, do you think that's something you think should be changed in, in correlation with what you just said? Yeah, well, I think that we should be doing as much as possible to attract foreign direct investment. We should make it as easy as possible for you to come here, both as an investor and a tourist. Yeah. So, you know, we should be making a, a, a virtually seamless visa system to attract particularly people from Europe and America who uh, have, uh, you know, uh, capital to be able to spend, both investing and on holiday, and incentivize them to come here. So, uh, and we're doing precisely the opposite. In fact, the government's making noise now uh, to ban foreign ownership completely, uh, which would you know, also further uh, serve to disincentivize uh, foreign direct investment in South Africa. What do you think is, is the incentive for them to run that, that line of political thought, to try and push away the international interest into the country? 
Well, I think it's a unhealthy ideological obsession. Uh, I think our governing alliance, uh, the Communist Party, the Trade Union, and the ANC, uh, which form this, what's called the Tripartite Alliance that governs South Africa, are stuck in outmoded 1980s ideology, Cold War sort of stuff. So, you know, they very much focus on state-led growth. Uh, and, and view foreign uh, involvement very suspiciously, unless, of course, it's from Russia and China. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's this, uh, you know, outmoded ideological obsession uh, with with foreign firms yeah. coming here, and you know, they they see it almost as a a, a suspicious uh, incursions into the country rather than uh, something we should be welcoming, uh, because those people bring the capital, they bring the skills, and they bring the investment that we need to get the South African economy moving again. Yeah. Taking that into like into the current election, if we look at your your possible coalition mm. talks with mm. the EFF, considering all the land returns <coughs> and what, what we've just been spe mm. speaking about, how do you think that's going to influence your mm. coalition talks mm. in coming to Trani and with mm. Johannesburg? Well, the great thing <coughs> about local government elections is yeah. that you know there's very little that the EFF could achieve in terms of their national manifesto about yeah. expropriation without compensation, mm. uh, seizing land, etc., um, at a local government level. Uh, and so I think that when you drill down what local government's about, it's about creating local investment, about mm -hmm. service delivery, uh, there's far more commonality between potential coalition partners than you would, for instance, say, at a national level where, you know, you start talking about things like uh, amending the constitution, diluting land rights, uh, diluting democratic rights. So I think it's a lot easier to negotiate at a local government level when it comes down to the brass tacks mm -hmm. of service delivery and how you can improve people's yeah. lives on the ground. And I think that... Uh, that the EFF and the DA have uh, uh, common interests around mm -hmm. fighting and combating corruption and about actually focusing like a laser beam on service delivery that makes a meaningful difference in the ordinary South African's yeah. life. Now the last election that happened last week, it was quite clear there's a difference between the urban South African population and the rural South African population. The rural population seemed to be much more in favour of the ANC and as we've seen in Shwane, places like that, the DA has gained ground, as it seems to, in more urban areas. Why do you think that happens? Well, I think there's, there's two reasons. I think that voters that are urbanised are far more informed voters, and I think that our rural areas still have a really strong patriarchal system, uh, which dates back to, to uh, tribes and uh, headmen who still play, and chiefs, who still play a very big role. They will come out and say, we're going to now go and vote for Party X, and the whole community goes and votes for Party X. I think the other reason as well is that because of the collapsed state of many rural economies, most of those communities and community members are almost entirely uh, sufficient on state grants. So child uh, income, uh, child uh, support grants, um, old age pensions, and many uh, you know, families there are existing purely on those pensions. So when the ANC goes in there with the message that, well, if another party gets into control, they're going to cancel your pension, cancel your child support grant, it's a very powerful message uh, for, and to incentivize those people to carry on voting for the ANC. Even though it's completely untrue, because of the uh, lower skills base, the lower educational levels in those areas, uh, those people are far more susceptible to that sort of damaging messaging that the government puts out there. And I think it's a trend uh, around most of the SADC countries as well. You'll see, even in Zimbabwe, you'll see the large parts of the urban population are voting for the opposition. Large swathes of the rural population are still very much held in the grip of, uh, you know, of the party of liberation. So what's the best way to tackle that, you think? Well, obviously, voter education is important. Um, but also, you know, we've got to uh, make sure that we, we continue to share a message with them that government grants don't come from a party, they come from the state. And you've got to try and you know, educate voters on the separation of party and state. And the weapon that we used this election was to show them that, in fact, the most efficient grant payment systems are under the Western Cape government, where we govern. And so rather, you know, as opposed to stopping grants and stopping uh, child, uh, child support grants, we actually administer them far better uh, through efficient systems and eliminating corruption than any other government in the country. Now, in terms of education, you have a slight issue with the fact that you've got 11 home languages, which must make it rather difficult mm. to actually have people educated in their home language. How do you think you can best integrate people's home languages into their education system? Yeah. Well, I think that you know, we, we took a decision uh, when we had the constitutional negotiation that we would have 11 official languages. And I think that each language should be afforded uh, equal status. And I think people should be empowered to be able to be taught and learn in their home language. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's, that's the, the trade-off that we made when we agreed to 11. So 
that means the state then has a responsibility to ensure that there is sufficient schooling opportunities in those traditional uh, home languages as well. Because in the tertiary education is quite a big issue in Islamic mm. politics at the moment. If we're looking at like the Fees Must Fall campaign, mm. um, do you think that this links in with our language policies, the inability to offer, let's say, Kwasi or Zulu at a tertiary mm. level on a full scale um, course? Do you think, how would you address that? How would you start changing that? Well, I'm not so sure it's, it's around not being able to. I think that there's plenty of funding. I just think there's massive corruption that takes place, uh, particularly around student funding, but also the funding of universities. Our universities have been completely underfunded. Uh, for the last two decades. And I think the government's uh, dishonesty around 0% fee increases for students uh, and for student fees is actually going to have exactly the opposite effect. It's going to mean that universities have to reduce courses rather than, than uh, add courses on and bring in extra tuition or bring in extra languages because they're now being forced to cut costs because inflation uh, you know, is continuing to grow. Uh, you know, suppliers' costs continue to grow, and yet university income is going to stagnate, which means they can't even keep up with what they're doing now with, uh, you know, with, with no, fee, uh, no fee increases. So government either needs to inject huge amounts of new money into universities, and we showed them in the last budget how they could do that if they focused more on, on student funding and, uh, and growing the economy, rather than on uh, four billion rand jets for the president and cars for ministers and houses for ministers, etc. They focus the money where it could be, we could do it. We could fund our universities properly and ensure that we are uh, providing the skill set that South Africa needs. Uh, but government uh, you know, has different ideas. Uh, and you know, so I think it's dishonest of them to say 0% fee increases for universities without then the commensurate government funding increasing for these universities to meet uh, their requirements. Um, a few months ago, MIT launched a, in, in correlation to this, MIT launched, launched a very one-year course, you could do computer science, you could do something through them in Cape Town, in correlation to the University of Cape Town, which they proved to be a very, very successful and inexpensive course, which I think cost around 10,000 rand to complete as a tertiary education, which is an amazing thing considering our university fees here. Do you think the government should look into developing those more um, in conjunction with what you just said? Because I do know as well that the DA have a ministry reduction policy where they want to reduce the to 15 mm. and um, do you think that's a more effective way of tackling it? Yeah well I think you've got to you know in government you've got to uh, you know cut your cloth according to you know to what you have yeah. and you know so I think that that you know those those sorts of projects are, are, are good and that's where we should be f applying the money. Mm. I also think there should be far more partnership with business in South Africa and industry yeah. in South Africa because there's no use pumping out huge amounts of graduates from universities in areas where there's no uh, potential uptake. So I think industry should be you know, partnering with government and saying, these are the type of skills that we're short of in the economy. These are the sort of skills we've got to try and import on an annual basis. Let's partner with you to help develop graduates in those particular industries and those particular disciplines that will then allow us to be able to absorb them into the workplace. There's no use pumping out you know, thousands of philosophy students uh, you know, when in fact the economy needs you know, plumbers and electrical engineers and, uh, and architects. Yeah. So I think there needs to be far more uh, coherence uh, and, and funding. And I think industry has a role to play as well in helping to bridge the funding gap uh, in producing those sorts of graduates that, that we need to, to get the skills going in the economy. Because the irony is that whilst we have massive unemployment, we also have a massive skills uh, gap. So yeah. even if our economy was growing at 3 to 6%, we don't have the skills in South Africa to, you know, to, to fuel that yeah. gap. And that's why when you have huge uh, infrastructure-led projects here in South Africa, which the government touts uh, as, a, as a solution to, to unemployment, often those skills have to be imported from other countries uh, because we just simply have that, have that gap. There also needs to be far more focus on the type of artis or artisanal skews, uh, skills that we need in South Africa, builders, plumbers, uh, bricklayers. Uh, to be able to, uh, to be able to, uh, and those technical requirements to be able to drive any economic growth that, that we can get going in South Africa. It's an interesting issue because I think a lot of countries, even developed countries, struggle with this problem where the, the lack of the STEM, the STEM skills at, mm. at, at school, schooling, so throughout mm. the system. So I think, do you, would you say that this starts at a very young age, mm. telling people that it's it's okay to, to train yourself to be a plumber, train yourself to be an electrician, opening that that world because there is the gap in the market for you, mm. in the employed market to enter into that. Mm. Do you think it should start more at a younger Absolutely, age? I and mean, that's part of the DA's policy as well. Yeah. We'd have the, the second streaming taking place far earlier in, mm. in a student's life. There's no use keeping somebody who has aspirations for a technical vocation 
and both should be treated the same. I mean, you should have a corner office as a banker, and someone who runs a plumbing business or as an electrical engineer should have the same status in, yeah. in society. And what we should do is allow people to stream out far earlier in their schooling career. No use keeping somebody who wants to pursue that technical vocation in an academic, uh, you know, traditional academic environment uh, for, for years. Yeah. They should be allowed to decide far earlier on that this is what they want to follow. We should have far more technical skills uh, in schools. We should have far more apprenticeships programs that are able to absorb and, and impart those skills to, uh, you know, to potential graduates. So that we're able to then uh, uh, bridge that skills gap in South Africa. Would you also, the state schools in Africa is very interesting. Um, you've got your Model Cs mm. and you've got your rest of the state schools, and the, the disparity between these schools are, are immense. Um, do you think how, how would you start addressing that, mm. making the equality in education possible for different regions mm. in the country? Because surely solving a lot of South Africa's issues starts at the grassroots of education. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, education is the key to, you know, to solving many of the issues that, we, yeah. that, are, that are wrong with South Africa. Um, you know, and again, we spend a huge amount of money on education, but we're not achieving the results. So, for instance, if one looks at the maths and science results in a place that's conflict-ridden like the Gaza Strip, far higher than what we're producing in South Africa. So there's clearly, you know, there's clearly a problem with the quality of education that's being imparted, and that comes down to ensuring that you have the right teachers and qualified teachers that are, are teaching in schools, and the irony is that some of the worst deal of, are, are those uh, students that are going to school in the former rural areas, many in mud classrooms still, uh, many with unqualified teachers. And so we need to up the quality of educators, we need to up the quality of uh, facilities that we offer, uh, and whether you go to school in Soweto or Santon, you should, as a, as a government school, you should be getting the same standard and quality of education. Unfortunately, uh, we have teacher unions that are far too powerful in South Africa, and they make uh, teacher and rooting out people who are unqualified as teachers very, very difficult. And so you you still have many, many teachers who will just simply leave leave school during the day to go into union business. Uh, you have uh, the schools where you know with with no science labs, no computer laboratories, and so you know you need to make sure that 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 funding follows. Uh, you know the outcomes that you that you want to be able to achieve, but not only that, you need to make sure that that there is huge quality um, assurance being done continuously, and so that you don't end up with, you know, somebody who who can't hardly uh, you know read or write English themselves, teaching English uh, to to rural children. And la education is the greatest ladder of of opportunity out of poverty and unemployment, and I think that far too many children in South Africa, particularly in Previously disadvantaged, you are still getting a far, uh, uh, far too much of a raw deal, uh, you know, under the current dispensation. Yeah. So you became a councillor at twenty-two, if I'm not mm. wrong. What made you want to get into South African politics at a relatively young age? Mm. I was involved in, in some service clubs, and uh, you know, when I was younger, and but it started far earlier. I was at school. I, I sort of just always had a very sort of sense of civic duty and civic responsibility. And we were involved with a project uh, through one of the service organizations I was involved with where the city council was being obstinate. We wanted to plant some trees on Arbor Day at a river location. And it was just such a hassle to be able to get the council to approve us being able to plant the trees there. Uh, and I, this was the first time I came face to face with bureaucracy. And so I realized then that if we wanted to change things, you know, you need to get involved and get elected, and so you know, I I did that, and uh, you know, so the rest is kind of history. You know? yeah. yeah. How have you found your political career so far? Yeah, I've enjoyed it tremendously. I mean, it's a, politics is a very, very uh, you know difficult business, uh, massive highs but incredible lows as well. But I think it's about being able to you know just keep pushing on you know through the difficult times, and just remembering that you are fighting people's corner. And you need to get out there every day and make sure that their voice is being heard and they're being represented. And you know, I think that's what keeps me going. The successes, like the recent election successes, you know, make up for all the, the difficult times and the dark days that you go through. So what's been your darkest moment in your political career? Um, probably, I mean, I had an incident in my, in my personal life. I ch took a decision to get divorced. And unfortunately, you know, obviously it got made a, you know, turned into a political weapon uh, by opponents. And, you know, most people go through their divorces privately. I had to endure mine very publicly on the front pages of newspapers, etc. Uh, but, you know, so those, those days are past now. And uh, as they say, today's headline, tomorrow's birdcage liner. And, you know, it doesn't sound like it at the time. But... 
you know, you, you move through these things. And I think that once people see that you're out there fighting for them, uh, you know, they're willing to, you know, to let those sorts of things go. And are you optimistic about the DA's future now? Absolutely. I think to, uh, given the current election results, it's terrific. Uh, whatever the outcome, South Africa was always going to be a very different place on the 4th of August. If the ANC got away this election with no consequences for uh, the President's homestead, Spenny and Kandler violating the public protector, violating the constitution and the oath of office, and the 783 charges of fraud, corruption and racketeering, uh, then I think they would have been given the biggest blank check. I think the South African public have called a big point of order on, on the ANC and said to them, actually there are consequences if you're going to do this. And they've given, uh, come out and voted for us uh, in far greater numbers. Uh, they've put us into government and a number of councils around the country uh, because they want change. They voted for change. And so I'm very optimistic. I've always believed that South Africa's best days still lie ahead of us. Uh, and that's what gets me out of bed every morning, you know, working forward to make this country uh, achieve its fullest potential and to take its rightful place as one of the greatest places on earth. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, no, thank, thank you. you. Good.